Hey guys, welcome back to the sixth video in this flame game development series where we are making Ski Master, a top down vertical scroller about skiing. So, in the last video, we saw how game objects can be spawned at runtime using the object layer from Tiled. And with that knowledge, we were able to place some collectible snowman in the level. All this is great, but so far we haven't done anything to prevent the player from going off the trail. And that is exactly what I want to address now. In this video, we are going to add some code to detect if the player is off trail. If found so, we'll respawn the player back on the trail. The first step towards this goal is to mark the bounds of the skiing trail in the tile map. This can be easily done using the insert polygon tool. To keep things organized, I'll create a new object layer called trigger. This layer will store all the trigger volumes that normally don't have any visual elements. To see the trail clearly, I'll disable the spawn point and decoration layers. Now, using the insert polygon tool is quite simple. You just create a polygon by placing the points of the polygon like this. Later in the code, we can create a hitbox out of these points using the polygon hitbox class. But there is a minor problem here. As of recording this video, Flame only supports convex polygons for collision detection. So, for example, something like this is fine as all the vertices of this polygon are convex. But something like this might cause issues with the collision detection as one of the vertex of this polygon is concave. So, to avoid any issues, we'll have to split the trail into multiple convex polygons. Depending on how you designed your trail, your setup might be different. But just make sure that you cover the whole trail in as less polygons as possible. And also make sure that all the polygons are correctly closed. To save some time, I'll speed up the video here. Ok, and once all the polygons are placed, I'll just select all of them and set their class property to trail. Now, we can unhide the other layers. And before going back to the code, I'll make sure to re-export the level so that we can see all these changes in the game. Now, back in the code, before we start reading the new data, let's do some minor refactoring to reduce the clutter in the onload method of gameplay class. First, I'll convert the world, camera and player objects into late final members of this class. Next, I'll extract out the world and camera setup into a private method called setup world and camera. Similarly, I'll extract out all the spawn point layer handling code into handle spawn points method. And you can already see how clean the onload method looks now. Next, to handle the trigger layer, I'll create a handle triggers method. Its basic structure will be similar to the handle spawn points method. First, we'll try to get the trigger layer from the tile map. Then, we'll loop over the objects of this layer. And similar to the previous methods, this one will also be called from the onload method. Now, inside the handle triggers method, let's add a case for the trail class. In here, I'll create a new polygon hitbox and store it in a local variable called hitbox. The polygon hitbox constructor needs a list of vertices for the polygon. This is basically a list of vector 2, so I'll create an empty one here. Now, the data for these vertices is stored with the object. But before we access it, let me quickly open up the level1.tmx file and explain the layout of this data. So, each of the polygon object looks something like this. It contains a x and y coordinate that represents the first point of the polygon. And then it stores a list of space separated coordinates that represent rest of the points of the polygon. But the catch here is that all the points in this list are expressed with respect to the first point of the polygon. This means, to get the actual coordinates of each point, we need to add the object's x and y coordinates with the point's x and y coordinates. So, back in the code, I loop over all the points from the object.polygon list. And inside the loop, I'll create and add a new vector 2 to the list of vertices by adding up the object's coordinate with the point's coordinates. Then, in the polygon hitbox, let's set the collision type to collision type.passive since these trail hitboxes don't need to check for collision in between themselves. Next, let's also set the isSolid property for this hitbox to true. 
this will make sure that Flame treats this as a filled hitbox and reports collisions for other hitboxes that are completely inside it. Now that the hitbox is ready, next question is, where should we add it? So far, we have seen that the hitboxes are added to other components that extend from position component. This is the most common setup for hitboxes. But hitboxes are also components and can be directly added to the component tree. The only requirement for such hitboxes is that they should have at least one ancestor that is a position component. So in this case, I'll add this polygon hitbox directly to the tiled component. This will work fine because tiled component is derived from position component. You might wonder why I didn't add it to the world component. The simple answer to that is because world is not a position component. Okay, now let's set the debug mode for this hitbox to true and test this in the game. And as you can see, all the polygon hitboxes for the trail are rendered correctly. Next, to detect if the player has gone off trail, we'll have to monitor all these trail hitboxes and track when the player enters or exits them. The easiest way to do that is to set up the on collision start callback and on collision end callback for each of the polygon hitbox. I'll ignore all the input parameters to these callbacks because we are neither interested in the intersection points nor in the other colliding component. Due to our setup, we can be pretty much sure that the other component will always be a player object. From these callbacks, I'll call onTrailEnter and onTrailExit method. Next, to track the number of trail hitboxes that the player is in contact with, I'll add a private integer called endTrailTriggers with its initial value as 0. I'll also add a private getter called isOfTrail which will return true if the end trail triggers becomes zero. Now in the on trail enter and on trail exit methods, we'll just have to increase and decrease the end trail triggers count respectively. And to confirm if this is working correctly, let's override the update method in this class and print the values of end trail triggers and is off trail. Now if I start the level, you can see that the trigger count and is off trail are in sync. And if I go out of the trail, it reflects in the logs correctly. Ok, now that we can detect if the player is going off trail, let's add some code to make the player reset when that happens. But I don't want to reset the player as soon as it leaves the trail. Instead, I want to have some wait time so that the player can try to come back on the trail before it gets reset. For this, I'll make use of the timer class provided by Flame. So let's create a late final timer member called reset timer in gameplay class. I'll set the duration of this timer to 1.5 seconds. This is the amount of time a player will get before getting respawned. Then let's set the auto start for this timer as false because we want to selectively start the timer only when the player is off trail. And finally, for the on tick of this timer, let's create a new method called reset player. OnTick is basically a callback function that timer will invoke when the set time duration gets over. Ok, now that we have a timer, we need to manually update it so that it can keep track of time. So in the update method, if isOfTrail is true, I'll make the timer update with the incoming delta time. Then next, if the timer is not already running, I'll start it. And exactly opposite to this, if is off trail is false and if the timer is already running, I'll stop it. This should take care of invoking the reset player method at the correct time when the player is off the trail. Next, to actually make the player reset, we'll need to have a safe position to which the player will be reset to. For that, I'll create a late final vector 2 called last safe position. I'll initialize this vector with the player start position while spawning the player component. This essentially means that on reset, player will be moved back to the very start of the trail. But this is just for now. In the future videos, we'll be adding a checkpoint system so that the players can be reset to the last safe checkpoint. Now in the reset player method, I'll invoke reset to method on the player with last safe position as input. And this method does not exist yet. So let's create that real quick. Okay, so in the reset to method, I'll set the player's position with the input reset position. 
then I'll also reduce the player's speed to half its current value. This speed penalty should hopefully make the player avoid going off the trail. Now let's save this and restart the level to test it. And as you can see, if I try to go off the trail, after some wait time, my character gets reset to the start of the trail. So this is working exactly as expected. And that is all for this video. In the next one, I'll most probably add a checkpoint system to avoid respawning the player at the start of the trail. So until then, make sure to hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Consider subscribing to show your support and I'll see you in the next one.